even on the plane ride home, after I'd gone in front of several hundred people and frankly the nation and said, I lost. I realized I lost an election. I didn't lose my soul. When it became very, very obvious that I wasn't going to be the president, and I knew the votes weren't there, I didn't have the delegates, and I knew I was going to have to go out there and tell my family and my supporters that it was over. In moments like that, you also remember that an election is not what life is about. It was incredibly comforting to know that even if I lost an election, something for which I had given almost two years of my life and that so many thousands of people across America had been a part of, that that wasn't the totality of life. It was not the sum of everything. You know, I knew that the same Lord who had given me life and then given me a rebirth when I was 10 years old uh, would never leave me and he would never forsake me. Welcome. Great to have you here today. Thanks for joining us today. I want to say a quick hello to all of our campuses real quick. Thanks so much for being a part of our services. Let's also give it up for our God Behind Bars, guys. Thanks for watching today. Thanks for being a part. You know, we all have unanswered prayer requests. We all have things we've been asking God to do for years, and, uh, and the Lord just seems to be either saying no or not answering. So what do you do? How do you deal with unanswered prayer. We all have that in our lives. And so I want to talk about that today. I think it's a reality that we all face. Pull out your notes if you would. As you do that, let's say our mission statement together. Our job is to do what? It's to take as many people to heaven. I like to hear you guys finish it out. Good job. Good job. Give yourself a hand right now for knowing what we're all about. Glad you guys are here again. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for being a part of Church Unlimited. I heard about this, uh, this mom. Uh, she was resting on the couch, and she heard uh, her, her young son yell at her from the backyard. He said, Mom, what would you rather have, me break my arm falling from a tree or tear open my Sunday slacks? She's like, well, I guess I'd pray that you wouldn't break your arm. And he said, your prayers have been answered. <laughs> Sometimes things don't always work out like we want, right? Sometimes we pray for things to happen that don't happen. We pray for something not to happen that does. And so those are realities that we, that we all face in our lives. And, you know, I'm, I'm making light of it, but the truth is there may be something you've been asking for for a long time. You're like, God, would you just come through in this area of my life? And it just hasn't happened yet. And that can be a very frustrating thing to think, Lord, are you just telling me No. Or are you just not answering me? What's the deal, God? I just want to know. I want to stay faithful to you. But Lord, it's just tough when I'm not getting the answer I'm looking for. All of us face this in our lives at some time or another. So let's take a look, and look at some scripture today and learn what we can do and how to deal with unanswered prayer. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. It says this, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked for of him. And so it says here, whatever you ask for according to his will. Did you catch that? Would you underline that? Because that's a pretty big little clause there, right? And so God says, I want to I give you a yes, but it, it just has to be my will. It just has to be something that I want for your life, you know? Just like, I, I can't, pr prayers are just, uh, are not automatically answered. I can't just say, Lord, do this, and just poof, it happens. If God said yes to every prayer request we ever prayed, that would be a dangerous weapon, right? Someone cut you off in traffic, smite them, Lord, you know what I mean? <laughs> Think about that. That'd be really scary if you could just immediately just have what you want anytime you want it, right? The Texans would win the Super Bowl every single year. I mean, that would not be fair, you know? Clearly, the Lord's being very fair with that, that's for sure. But the point I'm trying to say is, sometimes we don't get what we want because it's just not God's will. And so you have to be willing to understand it, that it has to be in His will. Look at the scripture goes on to say, it says in Jonah chapter 4, this is Jonah because he, he prayed, God, please do not deliver those people, right? Because God said, Jonah, I'm going to send you here and I want you to preach my truth to them so that they would know me and I would forgive them and, and, and restore them. And, God, and Jonah's like, no, I'm not going to pray that. I'm not going to preach that. I don't like those people. I don't want them to be forgiven. I don't want them to be blessed. And so he tried to, to go completely against the Lord and the Lord 
chastise him for that. Look at the scripture. It says in Jonah 4, verse 2, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God. I love how he's saying it's like, I knew you were merciful and compassionate, right? He's saying it like it's a, whole, like it's a bad thing, right? I knew you were merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. So Jonah was a bitter guy. He was very bitter, and he was like, Lord, if you're not going to kill them, then kill me. Wow. Isn't that funny? Bitterness is like that, right? Bitterness is when, if you're bitter or, or unforgiving towards someone, it's like you're taking poison and expecting them to die from it. It doesn't work like that. And so what happens, he's like, Lord, just smite them, just kill them, just take them out. I can't stand them. God says, but I love them, Jonah. They're my creation, just like I love you. And so, no, Jonah, I'm not going to answer your prayer request. I'm not going to do that. That is not my will. God's will is to bless them, to touch their lives, to change them, to see them receive him. And so that was his will. And so, number one, God says no if it's not his will. It's really pretty simple. Sometimes we say, oh, the Lord hasn't answered my prayer request. Well, maybe he hasn't, but maybe the Lord's answer is no. Maybe God did answer your prayer request. You just don't like the answer. Does anyone have kids in here like mine that will ask for something? I say no, then they ask 60 more times in a row after that. You know, so I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I stuttered when I said no the first time. I don't know how many times, how much time do you want to waste on this? And I've had to teach my kids, it's like, if you will focus instead of on the no I gave you, on the hundreds of yeses, that are potential for me to say if you'll just ask something different, <laughs> right? I want to say tonight at someone's house, so-and-so's house, no. I want to say, please, Dad, no. I want, no, my no's not going to change. But there are a hundred things you could ask me for. And I'd say, yes, you want to go to the movies? Yes. You want to go, you know, to, to the skating rink? Yes. You want to go bowling? Yes. You want to go out and do this? Yes. You want to go to this person's house? Yes. That person? No. My no's not going to change in that area because there's things I see that you don't see. Anybody relate to this? Parents, you know what I'm talking about? So sometimes we have to be willing to receive God's no because we just have to trust that he knows best and trust that there's a reason for that. So sometimes it's just not in his will, and he says no to certain things. I remember praying for a long time. I was at this church in Dallas, praying, God, please help this church to grow, help us to reach people. I thought, surely that's God's will for, for me to be able to reach people for Christ. I mean, why would that not be God's will? And the church just would not grow. I was preaching the same sermons I'm preaching today, and just nothing was happening. We had these, this board of elders. I would go to them, and I was like, this is what I think God wants us to do. And they told me, we don't believe that's what God wants us to do. And I was like, but I've been praying about this. This is what the Lord's put in my heart. They said, we don't agree with that. Go back and pray again to find out God's will for this church and come back and bring it to us. Okay. So I went back and came back and said, God told me the same thing. We'll go back and pray again. I went back and pray. I said, the Lord's told me again. This is what God is telling me. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And they said, we don't agree with that vision. Therefore, this isn't going to work out. Wow. I was praying. I was seeking the Lord. I thought this was God's will. It wasn't God's will. I had to step down from that position. I began to search the Lord. The Lord eventually led me to Corpus Christi. Thank God for no's. Yeah. Because it leads to yeses. So trust the Lord. Sometimes it's not that he doesn't want to do a certain thing in your life. He just, sometimes it's not that, that God's a God of no. It's a God, he's, he's saying no here so he can say yes there. So you just have to trust him that he has a plan for your life. And you know what we end up doing, by the way? We end up doing what I call contingency prayers. <laughs> this is like the girl who's like, Lord, I really want a boyfriend. And then she meets Mr. Goodlooking, right? That's, if you list all his qualities out, we'd have to stop there. Mr. Goodlooking, that's about it. And she's like, Lord, please let this work out. And God, you know, Lord, is this what you want? And God says, no, it's not. And what do you do? Oh, Lord, I'll make it work. It'll be great. And you start dating and you get all involved with each other. And you fall in love. You start compromising and all kinds of stuff. And now you're like, oh, Lord, please help this marriage to get better. Lord, just please. And God's like, you're asking me to answer prayers for you that when I told you no on the front end, that I'm not obligated to help you on the back end. In other words, God's like, I told you no, and now you've got yourself in a giant mess because you didn't listen to the no on the front end. I mean, how many times people take a job, oh, Lord, I, I want this job, and the Lord's like, that's going to involve compromise. It's not what I want for you. Oh, come on. Oh, Lord, it'll be fine. And then we ask God to bless that we're in the middle of a mess. And God's like, I, I, you've entered the territory that I am not obligated to bless. I did not begin that. I'm not obligated to finish it. So sometimes when we don't listen to the no's, oh man, we create big messes in our lives. Now, the God that we serve is a God of grace, and he'll help you get out of that mess, but 
again, that's probably going to be messy because it was a mess you got in to begin with. So, so be careful when you ignore a no because you're going to end up in living in contingency prayer mode, which is like, Lord, would you clean this mess up? And Lord, would you straighten this out? And Lord's like, what have you got? I told you no for a reason because this isn't going to go good. So we have to be willing to listen to the no on the front end. Otherwise, it gets really bad. Then the no's aren't from God. And then it starts coming from you going, no! It's not what I wanted to happen. God says, I didn't want it to happen either. So we can't ignore God's no's. He has a purpose. He has a reason even for the no's. And so we have to trust that. So when God says no, if it's not in his will, we need to listen to that. That's a good thing. Look at James 4, verse 3. Even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Oh, we all want what gives us pleasure, right? I mean, that's pretty normal, but if that's all we want, that's a problem. So God's not trying to say pleasure is bad. He created pleasure. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. It's when our lives become about pleasure only. That's where the problem comes in. Look at Psalm 66, verse 18. David said this, If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have, have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. And so he said, you know what? Because I got my heart right, God, you answered my prayer. <clears throat> but don't expect God to answer your prayer if your heart's not right. Now, here's what that means. You may be praying for something. Excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. I'm sorry, guys. Sweet nectar. Okay, so... You may be praying for something that God is not saying yes to, not because it's a bad thing, but because God's saying, I can't give that to you yet because your heart's not right. So it may be like, yeah, sure, I'd love to bless you with that relationship. But if you're not right spiritually, you'll mess that up. It's like there's nothing that I own that my wife and I own that we would not give our children. The only thing that keeps us from giving everything we own to our children one day is maturity. Do they have the maturity to handle it? I know of a couple who came to us years ago and said, Pastor, we, we, we want to, uh, to, to make the church as well as other organizations a part of our will. I was like, okay, wow, that's really nice. Thank you. People occasionally do that. And I said, well, I'm, that's, that's amazing. Thank you very much. And they happened to have millions of dollars. And, and they said, we want to include this. Well, are you going to do something for your children? And they said, we're not. I said, oh, wow, really, why? Can I, can I ask why? He said, I, we'd love to tell you why. It's just so sad, but we know what they would do with it. And we know we can't trust them with it because of some of the habits they have. And in this particular case, they knew they would excess themselves to death, literally to death, because some of their habits. I thought, wow, here are parents that want to bless their kids. They just can't. Their kids became unblessable from those who love them the most in the whole world. I wonder if God's like that with us sometimes. I wonder if the Lord's like, man, I'd love to bless you with this, but you got to prove faithful. Oh, Lord, help me earn $100,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Lord, I'm making $50,000, $60,000. Lord, I just want to make $100,000 a year. Could God be saying, I'd love to bless you with that. How are we doing on the 50 to 60 you make now? Are you faithful with me now? So you want me to give you more to be unfaithful with? You know, the average person spends about 10% more than they earn annually. Which means if you earn more, you'll get yourself in more trouble. You'll be more indebted, more creditors calling, rather than less, until you learn to control it. So God may be saying, I'd love to bless you with this, but you have to become blessable. Be faithful with what I give you, and I'll give you more. When's the last time you honored God with a tithe? When's the last time you honored your own future with savings? When's the last time you honored your children by being stable in your spending and realizing that the good thing is not to always go to the mall, but to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, I need to pull back and have something. If some Johnny breaks his arm, are we ready for that? If Sally needs braces, are we ready for that? In other words, like, Lord, I want to be faithful to what you've given me. And God says, if you'll do that, I'll give you more. So it could be that God's not saying no. He's saying, he's saying I've said yes, but your actions are actually saying no to me being able to give this to you. It could be that God wants to give it. We have to have the right motive. We have to have the right heart. We have to be ready for it. And so number two, God says no if we, if we have the wrong motives or unconfessed sin. What that means is we're not ready. It means we're not ready at that point. And so we have to be ready. I've had pastors call me up. Pastor, 
Would you help me grow my ministry? Help me grow my church. Just show me how we can reach more people for Christ. And I begin to go through some real basic things that you can do to minister to people, to reach people, that kind of stuff. But that's how I'm talking. I'll say, tell me, why do you want to grow the church? What, what, what makes you interested in growing your church? And oftentimes they'll begin to tell me things that frankly begin to rub me the wrong way. And I'll finally just say, you know what? I, I'm not sure if God wants to grow your church. Like, what? I'm sure God does. And so, yeah, but I hear you being more interested in becoming a big name or a big shot than reaching lost people. Which one's this about? Because you can be doing something really right and have the wrong motive, and God won't bless that. I mean, yes, is the church, does God want this church to grow? Of course, but is this about your name? Or is this about the Lord? Last time I checked, we're supposed to, to lift up the name of Jesus, and he'll draw them in unto him. Not lift up our names. It's Jesus that we lift up. So what's it about? What's the purpose? What's the motive behind the growth? What's the motive behind the income you want? What's the motive behind the promotion you want? What's the motive behind the house you want? What's the motive? There's nothing wrong with having stuff. It's when the stuff has you. There's nothing wrong with having position. It's when you make the position about you. And there's nothing wrong with having influence or affluence. It's when you influence and affluence is all about you. Are we willing to say, Lord, I want to honor you with everything I have? And when you do that, God says, I'll give you more because you make it about me. God does want to bless you. He does. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has given you. You just have to have the right motives. I heard about this couple. The guy turned 60 years old. It was his birthday. Him and his wife have been married 25 years. All of a sudden, poof, out of nowhere, an angel shows up. He says, I'm from the Lord. They're like, oh, this is so great. The angel says, the Lord told me to come and give each of you one wish. What would you like? Just pray that prayer and poof, I will grant it for the Lord. So the wife is like, this is so great. I've always wanted to travel all over the world. And poof, instantaneously, the angel had all these tickets to hotels and flights and everything. Hand to lace it. There you go. She's like, oh, this is going to be so great. She, he turns to the man, what would you like? What would you like the Lord to do for you? And he just kind of looks at his wife, looks at the angel, is like, well, um, I'd like for you to make my wife 30 years younger than me. And poof, he turned 90. <laughs> be careful what you pray for. You'll figure it out eventually. Okay. <laughs> God says no if we have the wrong motives or unconfessed sin. That really is a big deal. Check out the next scripture. It says in Matthew 26, verse 39, this is interesting. Jesus actually prays a prayer that God says no to. Kind of shocking, isn't it? Like, what? Jesus communicates something to God, and God says, that's not what I'm going to do. So he actually has a request outside of the Father's will. It's kind of surprising. Well, hold on, hold on. Does that mean Jesus sinned? No. Jesus was fully God and fully man. That means this. That means that he had, as a man, the capacity to sin, but he wouldn't. Just like you and I, once we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have God within us, right? Which means we're still fully man or woman, right? We're still fully human, right? But we also have the God particle in us, too. We also have God within us through the Holy Spirit, which means we have the capacity to be sinless, but we won't, right? But we will sin. Jesus had the capacity to sin, but he wouldn't. We have the capacity to be sinless, but we won't. And so Jesus, at this moment, shows his humanity and actually says, Lord, if there's any way I can get out of this, I'd like to do that, but I want your will to be done. Look at this prayer. This is very interesting. Matthew chapter 26. He says in verse 39, He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So Jesus self-corrects during the prayer. Lord, I really don't want to go through all this, but I know it's your will. So he submits to the Father's will. Thank the Lord, right? Because if he wouldn't have done that, we wouldn't have salvation. So he submits to the Father's will at this moment. Can I tell you something? Sometimes doing the right thing is also the painful thing. See, I think we had this mistake, mistaken belief that to serve God just means nothing but lollipops and unicorns and flowers. Like it's just all sweet, all nice, all fun, all the time. And that's just not true. Sometimes doing the right thing is the hard thing. If you ever had to confront someone, you know what I'm talking about. You know it's the right thing, but you know they're not going to accept it. You know it's going to be a mess. You know it's going to be difficult, but it's still the right thing. And you have to just trust the Lord and just do the right thing anyway. You just have to honor God. Sometimes doing the right thing is difficult, but it doesn't make, make it, you know, somehow change it from right to wrong. It's like, you know, I, I want to tell my boss off, but I know it's the right thing for me not to do that. I want to not forgive someone who really hurt me, and they'll probably hurt me again, but I know it's God's will for me to forgive them, right? To so do the right thing can sometimes also be a difficult thing to do. 
the, the, the bottom line is, is that we have to trust that the Lord knows best. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. The Apostle Paul is saying, you know what? I only know part of the story now. I don't know the whole deal because I'm not in heaven. I don't have the mind of God. So I only see what I see. So there's just some things I'm not going to understand. God is sometimes going to not answer your prayer, and you don't know why, and you may not know why till you go to heaven. And that's very difficult. I understand how, how painful that can be. I don't, I don't have some answers to the things I'd love to have some answers to. I mean, I remember years ago praying, Lord, why did I have to lose my first child? I don't have any good reason for that. I can't find anything in the Bible that tells me why that was necessary. I just have to believe, God, you're a good God, and I'm going to meet that child one day in heaven. And that's what I hold on to. That's my hope, right? There's some things we just don't have good answers to that we're not going to have good answers. Why did they have to leave me? Why did this person have to hurt me? Why did they have to go through this, right? And some of those why questions, we need to have a little why file in our mind, and we just file those away, and we say, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you. I don't understand why this happened. But you know what, Lord? I'm going to put that in my why file, and one day when I'm in heaven, I'll get to ask you, and you'll get to answer. But until then, Lord, I'm just going to trust in you. I don't know the why. I don't understand why. I don't know why there has to be crazy people around the world to kill each other. I don't know why. I don't know why there's terrorism. I wish I had a great answer for that, right? I don't know why bad things happen. I don't know why there's sickness and disease. I don't know why there's earthquakes and famine, but I just have to trust that the Lord is still good and just trust in Him. And so even when we don't have a good reason why, we need to do this. Number three, believe that God knows best because He has the complete picture. Believe that God knows best because He really does have the complete picture. So we just have to trust in the Lord. I love this prayer request. Someone, or this prayer, someone prayed this one time. Lord, today so far, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. Then I'm going to need your help. <laughs> How many of you guys can relate to that prayer, right? We do need to seek the Lord because, honestly, just being in prayer makes us do better, doesn't it? Just, just being in a continual attitude of prayer helps me be a better person, just, just seeking the Lord like that. Look at the next scripture. It says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. I love his honesty here. He says, to keep me from becoming proud. So apparently he already had an answer for why on this one. He says, to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So the apostle Paul is praying this prayer. Lord, would you please remove this thorn on my side? It really hurts God. Could you remove it? And God says, you know, I could, but I'm not going to. The answer is no. Now, we don't know if it was physically a thorn. Many theologians believe that literally it was a thorn, like he may have been running through some, you know, terrain at some point, there's been a big old nasty thorn, and bam, it lodged in him, it went in so deep that the doctor he went to or someone else said, you know what, to get that out, it's going to be far worse, we're just going to leave it in, right? I, I have friends that are in the military uh, and, and uh, also friends in, in, that have been police officers that literally have shrapnel or even bullets lodged in their body that the doctor said, honestly, it's easier just to keep it in you than to pull it out would be more damaging. And so they deal with the pain of that, right? And so the Apostle Paul physically could have had a thorn in his side. Or maybe he had some kind of internal bleeding and he called it a thorn. Maybe he had some kind of issue that, 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 that he was dealing with. We don't really know. Maybe as some theologians argue, that maybe it wasn't a, thorn, a literal thorn, but it was something in his life. Maybe he had a temper problem. Maybe the Apostle Paul had a lust problem. Maybe he just really struggled and thought, Lord, I just, I'm so tired of struggling with lust. I wish you'd just poke my eyes out, God. I'm just so tired of this. Maybe that was it for him. I mean, a lot of men think that, speculate that because he was a man, and many men struggle with that. Maybe the thorn in his side was a relationship he had with someone. You ever had to forgive someone, but you knew that the next week they're going to hurt you again? You're like, the problem is to keep talking. The problem is they're still in my life is that the moment I forgive them, then they go do something stupid again and make me mad again. I got to forgive them again, right? Maybe that was it for the Apostle Paul. We're not sure, but there was something that just God said, I'm not removing that. He was basically saying, Paul, you're a better man with that struggle than you are without it. 
Years ago, I had to go through back surgery. Two years in a row, actually, I had two surgeries back to back. And, uh, and my back is a little better. I mean, it was just excruciating pain. I could hardly even move. And so now I, I have movement, thank God. But I will tell you that after my surgery was done, I talked to my doctor and I said, so tell me where are my limitations? And he said, just any, you can do pretty much anything you want, just don't run. I was like, don't run? He's like, yep, no more running for you. I was like, I can't run. He goes, well, you can, but you're probably going to end up having surgery again if you do. So he's saying in a nice way, look, your back is not what it was. And so, you know, I've just kind of lived with that reality for about the last 10 to 15 years now that I don't run. It's kind of frustrating. I mean, I, I, I can run a little bit, but not much. Any kind of bouncing, you know, my basketball game is pretty much over. Of course, some would argue my basketball game was over from the beginning anyways. <laughs> but I can't really play ball much. I just, when I play with my boys or, or my daughter, I'm kind of slow moving around. I have fun, but I can't really run around. I just kind of stay right in the basket. That's all I can do, you know. I am officially all-time quarterback now when we play football with my family because I can't run, right? I just had to sit there and throw the ball, right? And so the point is, is that there are some limitations. And I'd love to just, I mean, I believe that God's a God of healing. He can heal my back. I have asked him to heal my back many times. Lord, would you just heal me? I've had people pray over me for healing, and I still have my back pain. And about once or twice a week, I've got to take some medicine and just chill out because my back just hurts, you know. And I try to work out regularly, but I regularly have to cancel workouts because my back hurts so bad. And so, you know what, I prayed, Lord, would you just remove this? And for whatever reason, God must must believe I'm a better bill with a hurt back than without it. It's okay. You know, Jacob wrestled with God and, and an angel of the Lord, an angel uh, touched his, his, his hip socket and knocked it out of joint. And, and apparently Jacob was better that he changed his name to Israel, but apparently he led better with a limp than he did with full health. So I wonder if there's some things we're asking God to remove from our life that God's saying, if I remove that thing from your life, you wouldn't be praying to me. The very thing we're asking God to remove is the very thing making us more like His Son. Could it be that God says, if you had everything you ever wanted and got every prayer request you ever needed, then you would never depend upon the Lord? So the strength about your weakness is that it causes you to depend, to depend upon God. The strength about dealing with an overactive temper or lust or anger, or maybe you're tempted by some kind of alcohol or drug on a regular basis and it makes you pray and stay away from certain places and certain people, maybe that's actually the strength of your life rather than the very weakness of your life. I mean, the Apostle Paul is the one who said, where I am weak, he is strong. So maybe that actually strengthens you to become a better you. Romans 8.28 says this, and we know that in all things, doesn't say all good things, it's all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So isn't it interesting that in the same sentence, God says, I work through all things, even bad things. But then he says, and what does it ultimately do? It helps conform you to be like my son. So you and I are more like Jesus because of difficulties than we are because of good times. Is that not true? Isn't it the hard times that shaped your character, right? This is why every parent has that lecture for, the, for your kids, you know? You're like, when I was your age, I had to walk uphill both ways to school in snow on broken glass barefooted. You know, that was like some horrible story, about, you know, right? We have some, and, and our kids are like rolling around, like, give me a break, you know? But you, trust me, kids, you're going to grow up one day, and you'll be telling some story to your kids. You're like, I remember back in the day, we had to actually type on our phone ourselves. It was horrible. <laughs> Rather than, you know, have your phone do everything for you, you know? The point is, is that, you know, we, we all have that, you know, oh, and I, and what we're saying is, we're saying that the, the fact that I didn't have everything I wanted built my character. The fact that we don't have everything that we want makes us better people, makes us compassionate, makes us very caring. It really does. I can't, th- I can't even calculate the amount of times I've been on my back in pain. I just looked up to the heavens and said, Lord, here I am again. What do you have for me today? Because my back pain has slowed me down, which has slowed me down just enough to speed me up because it causes me to seek the Lord. So I guess maybe I'm just going to stop and take a moment to publicly say, thank you, God, for my back pain. Because it's probably made me a better pastor. I know it's made me a better husband and father. And so the truth is that sometimes our difficulties are a good thing. It's painful as, as it is. John 15, this is what it causes us to do. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Bear much fruit means get results, but not just results, but spiritual results. 
So you may, you may be top sales, but when's the last time you ministered to someone you were selling something to? So he wants you not just to have results, he wants you to have spiritual results. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. Number four, let your unanswered prayer teach you to remain in him. Your unanswered prayer should teach you and me to remain in the Lord. Say, Lord, I, I haven't had this answered yet, but God, I'm just going to continue to seek you and walk with you and pray with you and, and just, Lord, you know what we need. You know, I have a big need in my life right now. And I've been praying like crazy, Lord, would you just show me what to do about this? And I just, I just ask you to provide for this. And if I didn't have that big need, I wouldn't be praying like, I, like I'm praying. So the needs in our lives cause us to depend upon the Lord more. That's the strength of those needs that we all have in our lives. Maybe God right now is just speaking to you saying, you know what? Maybe he's saying, I haven't given you a yes yet in that area because there's an area you haven't given me a yes yet. Maybe God's saying, that area of your life you keep holding back. You're, you're upset that I've said no in some area of your life or, 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 or it's gone unanswered. You haven't gotten the answer you want. But the Lord may be saying, but I keep making a request of you to give me this area of your life or that area of your life, to take a hard look at the sin and, and to make a change. And you keep saying no to me, then you get offended I say no to you? Maybe God's saying, you're focused on my no, and the Lord's saying, I'm focused on your no. What area of your life is God saying, time to work on you, time to make some changes? Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. We take a moment of prayer, a moment of time to pray. That Maybe during this prayer time, God is speaking to you saying, is there an area that you know you've said no to me on? That it's time to say yes. Okay, yes, Lord. I've been selfish. I'm going to become a giver. Okay, yes, Lord. I've been selfish. I'm going to forgive that person. Okay, yes, Lord, I'm going to let you look at every area of my life, including that back room where I've got some sins hidden. I'll confess that to you as well. That becomes yours. Okay, yes, Lord, I haven't dated like I should. Okay, yes, Lord, I haven't been appropriate in my relationships. Okay, yes, Lord, I haven't honored you at work. Lord, I admit that I need to get this right. Maybe God's saying, let's talk about where you've been telling me no. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if today you're saying, yes, Lord, whatever area you want in my life, you can have it. Would you just lift your hand high to God today? Say, yes, Lord, I, I've told you no, but I'm going to say yes to you now. Forgive me, God. I'm focused on your no, but you're focused on mine. Thank you, Jesus. You have my yes. All of me, every part of me is yours. I re-surrender my life to you fully. Any area you want, it's yours. Whatever I own, whatever I am, whatever my hopes are, whatever my fears are, it's all yours. I trust my life in your hands. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe your prayer today is that you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. He died and he rose again from the grave. So right now, if you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, he has forgiven you of your sins. He just waits for you to receive it. Just last service, after service, I was talking with a man who said, I just can't believe God would forgive me. It's just too easy. And I told him, I said, oh, no, no, it wasn't easy. It's too easy for you. But that's because you don't realize what Jesus went through. It was not easy at all. It's easy for us because Jesus went through the excruciating pain of being beaten and flogged stripped of his clothes, embarrassed and humiliated. His body was turned into holy hamburger meat for you and me. Died a grotesque death. Let's not pretty this up, guys. Our sin caused massive pain to Jesus. But he chose. He chose the cross because he knew I'm going to give my life, but three days later, I will rise again. He loves you so much. He died on the cross for you and for me. And he rose again, proving that he's God. With your head bowed, your eyes closed, would you receive Christ right now? By praying a very simple prayer. We're going to pray it out loud together across all of our campuses. Maybe you're watching online or by way of television. You can pray with us right now. Just say this prayer out loud with me. You can say, Dear Jesus... I realize what you did for me. You paid the price for my sin on the cross. I believe you died for me. 
and I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. I repent of my sins. I now want to make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name we pray. Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true.